I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is now 6 o'clock. If you all please uh, join me, we are welcoming Conroe's Junior ROTC to present the colors tonight. Captain Kevin Williams, Private Dearmore, Lieutenant Gonzalez, Private Stutes, and Private Newman. And our invocation will be done by Mr. Sanders and our pledge by Mr. Kidd. Ms. Rice. Mother Teresa was known in the Catholic Church as St. Teresa of Calcutta. She was born August 26, 1910, and was an Albanian, Indian, Roman Catholic nun and missionary. Her father died when she was eight, ending her family's financial security. Sister Teresa began teaching history and geography in Calcutta at St. Mary's, a high school for the daughters of the wealthy. She remained there for 15 years and enjoyed the work but was distressed by the poverty she saw all around her. In 1946, Sister Teresa traveled for a retreat. It was on that journey that she realized what her true calling was. Quote, I heard the call to give up all and follow Christ into the slums to serve Him amongst the poorest of the poor. End quote. One of her first projects was to teach the children of the poor, drawing on her experiences of teaching the children of the rich. She didn't have any equipment or supplies this time. She taught them to read and write by writing in the dirt with sticks. Teresa's first years in the slums were particularly hard. She was used to a life of comparative comfort and now she had no income and no way to obtain food and supplies other than begging. She was often tempted to return to the convent life and had to rely on her determination of faith to get herself through it. Word began to spread about Mother Teresa's good works, and soon she had other volunteers wanting to help. By 1950, she was able to start the Mission of Charity, a congregation dedicated to the caring for the hungry, the homeless, the crippled, the blind, the lepers, all those who feel unwanted, unloved, uncared for, people that have become a burden to the society and are shunned by everyone. She went on to open a hospice for the poor, a home for sufferers of leprosy, and a home for orphans and the homeless youth. Mother Teresa was honored with many awards throughout her lifetime, but most famously, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to her on this day 38 years ago in 1979. She continued her work with the poor for the rest of her life, leading the missionaries of charity until just months before her death, September 5, 1997. This is Mother Teresa's prayer for peace. Lord, make me a channel for your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love. Where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where there is discord, I may bring harmony. Where there is error, I may bring truth. Where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there is despair, I may bring hope. And where there are shadows, I may bring light. Where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by forgetting self that one finds, it is, for, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible.
Mark. Thank you again to the uh, Conroe Junior ROTC, uh, Dr. Weatherly. I know you're out there. Thank you very much for that program. Thank you, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Kidd. Um, Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not on our post, are posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure, at the lowest administrative level, a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. And delegations of more than five must appoint a rep one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Dr. Enrique Rosero. <clears throat> Good evening. I live in the woodlands, and although I pay CISD taxes, I'm privileged to send my key to private school, largely in part because the type of response that your school gave to the, inc to the sad incident that the f uh, family of the student king experienced this week. You have a choice to make, whether you want to be a school that harbors racists and fosters intolerance, a school that is no place for hate. And you have to recognize that the incident didn't happen in isolation, nor that it was an anomaly. It has to be seen in the context of Director Bunch inviting Confederacy statues to the community. It has to be in looking in the context of Senator Creighton and his effort to provide revisionist history. And frankly, in the context of the national revival of white supremacy. You are a non-partisan body. So you shouldn't be beholden to any fringe of any extremist group. Constituents that pay taxes in CISD are neither racist nor extremist. So we demand a government that rejects those behaviors and is decisive when confronting intolerance racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and white supremacy. I urge you to uphold the commitment you made to protect our students and fulfill your obligation to provide them with an environment where they can learn and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, continue. Uh, Deborah Lieber. Hello, my name is Deborah Lieber and I'm a volunteer of the Southwest Region of the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, a 104-year-old civil rights and human relations organization. First and foremost, I'm here as a parent and a longtime resident of the Woodlands where I have lived since 1984 and have raised my family. All three of my children attended CISD schools. I was upset last week when I read about the alleged incident involving a racial slur on Snapchat sent to a student at the Woodlands High School. I am always saddened to learn about students in Conroe Independent School District who have been victimized by hate. I am saddened and I can relate. My own daughter, who went through our public school system, experienced anti-Semitic taunts and behaviors as a student and I still recall the pain that caused her and our family. I would like to suggest that the school board encourage that all schools in the district participate in the ADL No Place for Hate initiative. 
The No Place for Hate initiative provides educators and students with the resources to ensure that anti-bias and diversity education are an integral part of the school curriculum. No Place for Hate is designed to engage the entire school community in creating a welcoming environment committed to stopping all forms of bias and bullying. ADL's No Place for Hate initiative provides a unique framework to incorporate new and existing programs with one consistent message. The initiative can help schools foster a culture of respect and create a safe learning environment for students at all grade levels. ADL's No Place for Hate initiative has been embraced by public, private, charter, and parochial schools across the country as school officials recognize the positive impact on the student body. The campaign has the added benefit of preparing young people to live and work successfully in our pluralistic nation and global community. To earn the No Place for Hate designation, schools commit to creating a student-led coalition, signing the ADL Resolution of Respect, and implementing at least three anti-bias and or diversity related activities during the school year. Last year, 365 schools in the greater Houston area achieved the No Place for Hate designation. Humble, Klein, Spring, and Fort Bend ISDs had many of their schools participating in No Place for Hate. We have been told that Dr. Mark Henry of SciFair is encouraging all schools in his district to become No Place for Hate campuses for the 2017-2018 school year. It should be our goal to have a majority of CISD campuses become No Place for Hate. If you're interested in more information, you can visit the website, which is www.adl.org slash No Place for Hate Houston 2017. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amy Hamrick. <clears throat> Thank you for letting me speak before you this evening. My name is Amy Hamrick. Um, my husband and I are homeowners in Conroe ISD. We are an interracial family. My husband is African American and our children are biracial. Our two children started school this year at Powell Elementary, um, and I was very pleased at the diversity in the student body there. Not as pleased with the lack of diversity in the school administration and teachers, but very pleased with the student body diversity. Um, I was very upset, as so many of us were, at the incident last week at Woodlands High School. Um, and my concerns as a parent of very young minority children in the school system is how they're going to be perceived and how they're going to be treated as they grow older and go forward. I know that the school district, the board, the principal, and everybody involved um, are limited legally as to what they can say publicly, but I would have appreciated a very strong statement perhaps in a different a press release, something outside of the news releases regarding the incident, something independent from Conroe ISD saying that they do not tolerate this behavior in the school district, and that was never done. It also bothers me and concerns me that so many of my friends who have high school age children said that their children were not at all surprised by what happened. That th statements like this are made frequently enough that it was not a shock. And again, as a parent of minority children, that very much concerns me as my children get older. I was also concerned that even though Deborah Lieber and her fellow volunteers brought the No Place for Hate program to all Conroe schools last at the end of last year, beginning of the summer, no, not a single one has applied as far as I'm aware. It seems to me a very basic step to do a program like this in the schools. And I know there's a kindness program already. This is a little bit more um, structured, I think, and has a, a national designation to go, to go along with it. So I would encourage you all as the board for Conroe mm -hmm. ISD to encourage the individual schools to think about doing something like No Place for Hate or some other national designation program going forward into next school year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Jennifer Majors Bacha. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Jennifer Majors Bacha. Uh, I moved to the Woodlands in 1978. My husband and I uh, live in Panther Creek and we have two boys. Uh, my oldest son I sent to a private school called Kunai International uh, because I wanted him to be exposed to um, world views and my youngest attends Sally K. Ride. The reason that I decided to speak tonight is because uh, one of my members, uh, my friend and I started something called the Woodlands Coalition for Equality after the election and more and more I've been willing to get out and speak in public. I think in the beginning a lot of people thought we were paranoid and that we had nothing to be concerned about and I'm hoping and praying at this point that at least there's a little bit of understanding that based on what's happened both nationally in Texas and locally um, people have become emboldened and it's terrifying for several of us. I'm very fortunate uh, that, that I haven't had an incident with either of my sons yet. Um, and so on behalf of a, a, a gentleman that is a member of the Coalition for Equality, I'd like to read his letter. And please understand this is coming from his frame of reference. So the letter says, by now the racist Snapchat incident involving the daughter of RJ and Latoika King, I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly, at the Woodlands High School is public knowledge, as are the unsatisfactory actions taken by the school administration to resolve the incident and ensure the safety of the student. I understand that so far the response of the school has been to offer Christless counseling to the victim and rearrange the offender's schedule. Unfortunately, given the gravity of these remarks, which could be defined as a terrorist threat, that response seems insufficient. As a parent with several children attending schools in the district, not only am I concerned about the lukewarm problematic response to this incident, but also concerned about the creeping climate of racially charged harassment and bullying of students in this area. This incident is not the first of its kind, but merely the most recent. Just a few weeks ago, there was the First Amendment violation at Winfern High School in the Cypress Fairbanks ISD, in which the student was suspended for refusing to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Earlier this year, in the same district, several students decided to pose with Hitler's salutes in their class photo. Not long after that, several students at the McCullough campus reported another student goose-stepping down the hallway while chanting KKK. One of my children has reported incidents of racially charged bullying at the intermediate level. Thankfully, the administration has taken these incidents seriously, especially after a recent staff change. I'm sure that you're aware of the Woodlands Township Diversity Proclamation adopted this spring. During the consideration of this measure, many residents preferred to stick their heads in the sand and minimize the experiences of those who had suffered discrimination in this area. After all these incidents, which are now being widely reported, I would hope that now more people understand that there is a problem in this area and it is affecting those most vulnerable. Proclamations are nice, but historically there has always been a credibility gap between words and deeds when it comes to proactively eliminating the effects of discrimination and prejudice. To that end, I and several other parents within Conroe ISD insist that the school board make it a priority to bridge this credibility gap. One strategy for accomplishing this task would be to implement No Place for Hate initiative created by the Anti-Defamation League within Conroe ISD high schools and possibly down to the intermediate level in the future. ADL's No Place for Hate initiative is a school climate improvement framework that provides pre-K to 12 schools with an organizing framework for combating bias, bullying, and hatred, leading to long-term solutions for creating and maintaining a positive climate. No Place for Hate schools receive their designation by building inclusive and safe communities in which respect is the goal and all students can thrive. Empowering students, faculty, administration, and family members to take a stand against hate and bullying by incorporating new and existing programs under one powerful message. Sending a clear, unified message that all students have a place to belong. Many other students in this region have implemented this initiative, including Umble ISD, Katy, New Caney, Spring, and Tomball. The program is implemented, and Katy in particular has achieved remarkable success in its efforts in reducing intolerance and creating a climate of positivity and acceptance. 
I have no doubt that our children and faculty here could do the same given the chance. Thank you for your consideration, Chris J. Miller. And the last thing that I'd like to say is that I think it's really important uh, to say that until you've walked in somebody else's shoes, you have no idea. So not hearing or experiencing or seeing something happen does not mean that it did not happen. Um, I was recently told a story about a student that had said some things and the mother was attacking another mother saying that that didn't happen. And when uh, the other lady told her to ask her son if he's ever heard anything like that, not only did he say, well, yes, he admitted that it, he actually had said those things. And to the mother's credit, she came back and apologized. And I think that the biggest thing that we could do for each other is just truly listen. So uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Randall Kalina. Good evening, Conroe ISD uh, school board members. My name is Randall uh, Callanan, and I am a civil rights lawyer and former uh, president of the Houston American Civil Liberties Union. And I'm here today as a citizen uh, concerned about students and discrimination. And I am uh, very concerned about the uh, Snapchat incident whereby one student in the, uh, oh, the Woodlands High School sent to another student in the Woodlands High School um, the message which included, we should have hung all you N-words while we had the chance. And trust me, it would make the world better. The only difference with this Snapchat, Giuseppe, which I read, was that N-word was not used and the other word that we all know was used in its place. This would be extremely intimidating to an African-American student in the Conroe ISD, of which there are approximately 4,500. So this student still is amongst all those other African-American students, not just the uh, daughter of Latoika and R.J. King. The response of the principal was to suggest that R.K. King and Latoika King's daughter move to another school. Hey, you can move to another school, you know, and give up your friends and go to a strange place and uh, so forth. And gave her some days off, you know, more days away from the school. However, according to the school, there was uh, no discipline, save maybe for a limitation on, a, uh, on electronic devices by the offending student at the school. A recent meeting with the uh, superintendent of the school district uh, did not... Uh, result in anything, um, no discipline for the uh, student, um, no training, uh, no uh, discipline for the uh, principal who was also uh, you know, involved, the one who did nothing. As a matter of fact, apparently the principal said that law enforcement was contacted with because of course the idea that all African Americans should be hung by most people's standard would be a little bit threatening. So at the very least, maybe you wouldn't arrest anybody, but investigate and maybe at the home you'd find a lot of guns like you do nowadays with unfortunately all these mass shootings, but not even that simple little thing was done. So um, what we see here is reason for the Conroe Independent School District Board to act. You are the governing body. You are above the superintendent. You are above the principals and you make the policy. I was surprised when I got here that all the other speakers in front of me were talking about the same thing. There is a huge outcry and the outcry is not ending. The media is here today and some national media has contacted us and I would like for the Condo Independent School District to get into the national media and the media and say, you know what, we're nipping this in the bud, here's what we did, X, Y, and Z. Thank you. Thank you. R.J. King. <clears throat> wow, I was unaware of uh, my wife, looks like a king. Um, greetings, I am R.J., I'm the father. This is my wife, Latoika King, and we were unaware of everyone who came up to Thank speak. Thank you, guys. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, my wife and I and my two daughters moved here about a little over a year ago from Michigan. Um, mostly based on um, our youngest daughter, who's a nationally recognized gymnast. And of course, you guys may be aware that this area is the headquarters for women's gymnastics. Um, and we also have another daughter, a 13-year-old daughter, who's, uh, who does quite well for herself also. She's an excellent student athlete. Um, currently, all A's and B's in AP classes, and was currently having a great year. I mean, super excited about the year. Um, we moved to the Woodlands because we heard great things about the Woodlands. Um, unfortunately, last year, she was faced with one incident that put a little damper on her uh, year at school at McCullough Junior High School. Um, after the election, she faced a comment by one of the kids to say that, are you worried about getting shipped back to Africa? You know what? Kids say dumb things. She wanted us to come pick her up. She was, she was uh, pretty traumatized and crying, but I told her, I was like, look, Cameron, that's not going to be the last time you hear about that. I want you to suck this one up, okay? But this past three weeks, this, this was something that I could not give her the message to suck up. She was traumatized, and she was in instant fear by receiving this Snapchat message. And I know because she brought it to me right after receiving it. Now, we've gone to the administration. Um, first, thing we, first chance we could, my wife sent an email to, to the principal and the assistant principal, and um, they brought us in right away. So that told us, like, oh, they think this is serious also. Um, we talked to them. One of the things they advise is, please take this to the, to the police and report this right away. So with that being said, we thought this matter would be taken serious and the proper uh, action would be taken to remove this, 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 this individual from a safety standpoint, not only for my daughter's sake, but for the rest of the African-American kids there. Because if you have enough gall to say something that evil and something that in inappropriate, there's no telling what your actions might take you to do. Now, you guys are aware of David's Law. You guys are aware of many things that happen off, off campus that you go right into uh, the school and take action right away with it. Don Stockton, we feel like we've been sent on a wild goose chase. We feel that changing a kid's schedule and changing a kid's lunch to ultimately not allow my, my daughter to come in contact with this kid was clearly not enough. Clearly not enough. And of the 60,000 plus students that are in the district, 4,500 of them are black. What message are you sending to those 4,500 students if you don't take proper action and have zero tolerance for this kid? If you don't take action, guess what that says? You condone what's going on. There needs to be clear action taken. This, kid's needs, this kid needs to be um, removed. And this communication needs to go out to the entire district that says we're not tolerating this type of behavior. Because now my daughter's traumatized and walking on eggshells. So Dr. Null, Dr. Stockton, we would like for some type of remedy to be taken quickly um, after this meeting, um, we would appreciate the rest of the board stepping in. However you guys do things, whatever type of meeting you guys need to have, whatever type of consultation needs to be, needs to be taking, taking place, we urge you guys to do it because we would like this to end as soon as possible, but only if the right actions are taken. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. King. <clears throat> Cynthia Cole. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity. And my name is Cynthia Cole, and I am a board member of the Greater Houston Coalition for Justice, and I realize I only have five minutes. You've heard all of the appeals and all of the um, suggestions. SB 179, which actually went into effect September 1st, 2017, is the governing uh, bill 
uh, that requires that all school districts in the state of Texas have policies and procedures in place to ensure that there is a uh, opportunity for there not to be any cyber bullying or bullying in the school period. The policy should outline what are the disciplinary actions and they should be consistent. It appears that the disciplinary actions are inconsistent. The incident that happened with the Kings does not seem to be just one incident of the parties that are involved, the one party who made the comment. It seems to be that possibly the individual's comfortable. I'm challenged because I don't think these children have been here long enough to be comfortable with some of these ideologies unless somebody is supporting that. Please, as the board, as the superintendent, as the body that is in charge, we can actually fix this. It's doable. Everyone that appealed here today, it's doable. What is not doable is to go backwards. Children don't have a clue to what the things or some of the stuff that they say or put on a Snapchat or whatever. They're not, they're clueless because they're still growing. Some up, some out, doesn't matter. They're still growing. But you all are the adults in charge. Fix it because it can happen. We can get along. You can't tell me that an area that just got hit by Harvey and everybody pour out their hearts and help one another can't fix this. It can be fixed. Do it. You have SB 179 on your side. The Texas Education Agency is absolutely on your side and can give you the framework and the outline to get it done. No African-American child ought to walk around trying to understand anything that would be a joy of somebody wanting to kill them simply because of the color of their skin. So I am here today to implore you to take the opportunity and make it right. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Beasley. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Matt Beasley. I, uh, my issue is very trivial to, to, to y'all's issue, to the Kings. I've, I started something two months ago, and I'm trying to get it addressed with the school board. But there's a lot of people in the community, you know, especially in the Woodlands, that are good people. And I just wanted to tell you all that. I uh, started a petition because I don't agree with the transportation policy. You've seen my face before. I've spoken with many of you. I was going to present it at the workshop. Um, but I spoke with a school board member, and they weren't sure I could speak at the workshop. So I waited a month. This petition has almost 1,200 signatures on it. These people are taxpayers. They're parents, and they're tired of their kids walking through ditches, carrying their musical instruments f for two miles a day, the parents walking four miles a day. The school district has $128 million in its savings account. We would like our kids to get the same service that everyone else gets. So I would like to include this with the minutes of the board so I can point to it at a later date when I need to. So should I should I give this? Be fine, yeah. <clears throat> and, and furthermore, have, have y'all ever heard the expression that politicians say, let's run government more like a business? Y'all ever heard that? Well, I want you guys to run your business like you run this government. Mr. Husbands, I know you're in the insurance industry. If someone paid to have insurance policy, and they came to get a claim, would you tell them, well, you know what? You're able-bodied. You got some money. You fix it. Miss Bush, if someone wanted to have you provide bookkeeping service, would you give them an aptitude test and determine, hey, you're, you're smart enough to keep your own books, but thank you for the money? You wouldn't do that. That's what you're doing. You're keeping my money. I want my kid to get on the bus. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Jason Millsaps. Mm 
Good evening. I also echo what Matt said. Um, this is not related to your incident. I apologize for that. But it's another incident that uh, issue that affects the community at large as well. So, uh, Madam President, members of the board, I stand before you tonight in two capacities. One is chairman of the Montgomery County Young Republicans, who earlier today passed a resolution unanimously that was distributed to you guys earlier this morning that uh, calls for reappraisals of homes affected by Hurricane Harvey. I'd like to read a portion of that resolution now. And it says, whereas Hurricane Harvey damaged and destroyed many homes and businesses within Montgomery County and within many areas across Texas, and whereas these damaged areas, including Montgomery County, have been declared a disaster by the governor of Texas and the president of the United States, and whereas the Texas tax code permits entities such as yourselves to request reappraisals of all damaged properties within their jurisdiction based on post-disaster value, whereas the Montgomery County Commissioner's Court, the Woodlands Township, Montgomery County Hospital District, cities of Conroe, and Montgomery, Willis ISD, have all approved reappraisals at this time, whereas Conroe ISD has rejected the reappraisals based on a false belief that it was outside of your jurisdiction in a 5-2 to two vote on September 19th, 2017, Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Young Republicans thanks the taxing entities who have already approved reappraisals for damaged properties within their jurisdictions, and be it further resolved that the Montgomery County Republicans, Young Republicans, excuse me, call on Conroe ISD and the other taxing entities in Montgomery County to approve a reappraisal uh, method for damaged properties within their jurisdictions. This item on your agenda later tonight, it's the right thing to do for our community for both business owners and homeowners who are currently suffering the effects of a loss or total loss of their property. Nothing is like kicking a man while he's down than sending him a tax bill on a house they can't live in. Something needs to be done about this. You had the opportunity, you failed, now it's time to fix it. As a concerned citizen, parent of a student that goes to your school, and a taxpayer of this district, I urge each of you to utilize the unobligated surplus which has a correction of what was said earlier, has reached $166 million in the bank as of August 31st of this year. This is our money, not yours. Belongs to us, the taxpayers. Give it back to us. Those of us affected by the storm deserve some relief. Tonight, you have that chance to give it to them. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, finally, finally, we have George Young. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Young, and along with my wife, Shirley, we purchased a home in Montgomery County in a community called Bender's Landing. We purchased it on March 26, 2017. I wouldn't be annoying you tonight, but I have called uh, and harassed the construction group from the Conroe ISD until I figured that they are not going to do anything. The problem is about a week after we moved in, behind us, they started uh, strip, strip mining, mo removing all the trees out of a large track to build the Woodson's Reserve Middle School. There are very few houses in Woodson's Reserve that I can see, but they're going to have a big middle school. Now, what uh, it appears to me that the contract that Conroe entered into with the company that removed the trees, they must have received payment for the trees, which would make sense because most logging companies do purchase trees. But the community has setback rules, which say you can't destroy all of the trees on your land. You have to give a buffer between the person behind you. Well, the construction company started out their deviousness by removing all of the trees behind my house. I was lucky enough to stop them from destroying all of the trees behind my neighbor's house, all of the neighbors. Um, this started about a week after we moved in. And, and then it gets gradually worse because they start doing their, their work between 2 and 4 in the morning. 
When I called and complained about that to your construction division of Conroe ISD, I was told, well, that's the only time of day you can pour concrete. Now, that's not only a lie, that's a stupid lie. I mean, anybody, you go around, you see concrete poured all day long. Nothing is done about it. They put up floodlights at night because they need to see what they're doing, right? If you're out there at 2 in the morning, you don't want to be tripping over the guy behind you. So they put these floodlights on, and they have these trucks to back up, and they have noise. They're honking their horns. They're screaming at each other and generally waking me up. Well, I've called uh, the police, and I've called the Conroe ISD, and by the way, I've come to find out that Conroe ISD is above the noise ordinances, above all laws. They, Conroe ISD can do whatever it wants. The police won't do anything. The county commissioner told me to go and get a city ordinance or something. Now, think about this. If at 2 in the morning, your neighbor gets a band to come over, and I don't care what kind of music they're playing, it could be real low symphony music. It could be rap music. It could be bluegrass. I don't care. If it's loud enough to wake you up at 2 in the morning, I bet you're calling the police. But it, it really disappointed me because we only moved up here March 26. Two weeks later, all this nonsense starts, and we come to find out that it, it, maybe we shouldn't have. Maybe we should have gone somewhere where the school district has to comply with basic common courtesy. And so... Um, I want to let you know that, the, wanted to let you know what was going on and, and see if you can do something because I'm sure if this was going on in your, behind your house and you were being kept up, they, it goes on late at night too. I mean, these guys have to have a contract that says if you finish early, we pay you more because there's no way you would get construction crews to work over like that. But I hope you look into it, and if you don't, well, that's up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all for your comments. Uh, that section of our agenda is done. We're moving on. Uh, consent agenda. I've had no request to remove any items. Do I have a motion to approve? Madam President, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right. All those in favor? Motion passes. Item 4A, receive Texas <coughs> Accountability Summary, SAT, ACT, Advanced Placement, Tell Pass Results for 2017. Dr. Stockton. Okay. I'm going to ask Dr. Null to come up and present that report, please. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. Uh, this is uh, always an exciting month for us when we have an opportunity to present to you what we um, lovingly refer to as our ABC report. Uh, so many different acronyms here, but this is an opportunity for us to share the good news of what's going on on our campuses and how well uh, we're performing. I do want to take an opportunity to thank uh, the team that has worked to put this uh, presentation together. Um, and some, some of these folks are out actually at staff development, so they're not here this evening, but I, I do want to read everyone's name because they've um, certainly earned that. Dr. Chris Hines, our Deputy Superintendent. Jim Caker, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education. Dr. Debbie Phillips, our Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education. Shelly Winkler, our Director of Elementary Education. Dr. Tamika Taylor, our Director of Assessment and Evaluation. Greg Shipp, Director of Career and Technical Education. Darren Carlisle, Coordinator of Bilingual and ESL. Denise Sapola, Coordinator of Guidance and Counseling. Debbie McNeely, Coordinator for Advanced Academic Programs. Laura Willard, our College Readiness Specialist. And Ms. Tricia Fessler, who um, has the job of trying to keep Dr. Hines and I uh, in order each day and does a fantastic job. Um, this team worked hard to put together this report, but it, it should be said that 
we're just the fortunate ones that get to share this good news. The work is done in the buildings. It's done on the campus. It's done in the classroom. And I know that we have a lot of campus administrators and teachers here tonight. And so for them, I want to say thank you. Um, they're the they're truly the ones that have created what I'll, what we'll share this evening. We'll start off by looking at our TEA accountability summary. Um, this is the one page accountability summary. It, it's not the new system anymore. I think we've done it enough years now to not call it the new system, but it is our system. Um, and we're going to we're going di to dive deeper into uh, the different components of this accountability <coughs> summary. But at the top, you'll see our accountability rating is met standard. That's the highest rating that we could have. Uh, moving down the sheet, you'll see the performance index report. We will we will dig into each of those areas. Um, distinction designation for the district. We'll also dig into that and system safeguards as we move forward. But we'll start uh, this evening with the performance index report, looking at the four indices um, that were measured as a district. Index one is the student achievement index. Um, simply put, this is how many students pass or fail the test. And this is all students and all the different types of tests that are given. They're all uh, aggregated into one area. And the state target score for this uh, index one is 60. You can see that we performed at 85 and the state at 75. Index two is student progress. So it's growth. Um, we receive a one point for a student that makes one year's growth um, in the year, and we can receive two points for a student that exceeds that. So we have students that make more than a year's progress during a school year. And our index two score of 45 is well above the target score of 22. And you can see the state's uh, score as well. Index three, closing the performance gaps, measures uh, how a district performs, um, looking at the economically disadvantaged students, as well as the two lowest performing subpopulations from the previous school year. And we were at 49, stayed at 40, the target score is 28. And finally, the uh, fourth index, the final of the four indices, post-secondary readiness. Um, the emphasis here is that we graduate students from high school that are ready to move on to be successful in either college, the workforce, the military, whatever they may choose to do once they leave high school. They're not just high school graduates, but they're ready for the real world when they move on. And you can see that it takes into account star scores, um, graduation rates, uh, the graduation plans, which graduation plan students uh, choose to take, and also performance on tests such as TSI, SAT, ACT. Our score is 82, the state at 76, and the target score is 60. The system safeguards, uh, this is where the, the data is disaggregated and kind of drills down into each subpopulation in each test um, to look at the performance in that manner. And we met 74 of the 86 standards uh, for this school year at 86%. Uh, our target areas continue to be special education and English language learner performance. And I would tell you, that's not unique to us. Uh, that's, you know, all of our districts that we compare ourselves to, they, they're facing the same challenges and we, we continue to work on that. And you'll see um, these areas reflected in the district improvement plan and campus improvement plans that will be presented for your approval next month. For district distinctions, uh, as I mentioned, you know, school districts are only um, eligible to receive one distinction. In order to receive a distinction, you must reach 55% of the, the total measures, and you can see that we scored at 32%, uh, which is still very strong, but we're working hard. We want to get that distinction. Uh, it doesn't happen often for a large district, but we think we can do that, and we're just going to keep working. Our campuses can also earn distinctions, and um, sometimes you'll hear campuses refer to this as stars. Mm. We can get stars, right? And, and th that's the distinction. And they can earn those for student progress or closing achievement gaps, post-secondary readiness, and then also just academic performance in different areas. And based on the great, the level of a school, they may be eligible for more stars than an, another level just because of the number of tests they give, um, et cetera. When you look at our campuses, we're re really proud of our campuses. They, they earned 37% of the total possible um, distinctions that were available. And you can see there, Katie and Cy Fair, we've, we, the, the three of us have sort of bounced around on this slide over the last three years. We all performed very highly, and, and those are good benchmarks for us um, as we look at our performance. All right, moving on, kind of switching gears here. Uh, each year we like to share with you our tell pass results and look at how 
um, successful our English language learners are. And uh, TELPASS is, is part of the ESSA accountability system for our English language learners. And we want to show the progress of our students. And it's measured in four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then each of those domains are, are looked at with a proficiency level. So you have beginning students who have little or no English ability, your intermediate students who now have a simple language structures, advanced students who are now grade appropriate and, and they're able to, to perform well in the classroom but they need some support uh, to help them perform. And then your advanced high students are now able to perform in a classroom with really minimal support. We show this chart every year and it's a lot of numbers and it's a big chart. Uh, but this is a snapshot of where our students are um, or where they were as of last year. Uh, how many students in each grade level um, fell under each performance level. So, um, you know, what you would expect to see, and once again, this is a snapshot, so we're not seeing students progress through this system, but you can see kindergartners, it's expected you would have more students at the be at beginner level. Um, as they move through the system, you'll notice more and more they become advanced to advanced high. Uh, one interesting note is you look at ninth grade, all of a sudden the beginning pops back up. Mm -hmm. It's because we have a lot of newcomers that come in into high school, into our high schools. Um, you know, high school's challenging anyway, right, for all students, but to come in as a, an English language learner or as a freshman is, is very challenging. We'll talk about that more. We, we see some star results, but they really do very well, our students do, um, and thanks to our great teachers that are, that are doing that work. Um, this is a, a new look for us. We wanted to see, well, how, how well do we uh, progress our students? And the TELPASS ratings are not uh, an annual rating jump, meaning you shouldn't necessarily make uh, a categorical jump each year. It's not considered one year of progress. Okay. okay, so just because you were beginning this year doesn't automatically mean you should be intermediate the following year. It could happen that way. Some students may advance two or three levels in a year that that could happen as well but this um, helps us to see where are we making growth and you can see from 2015 to 16 to 27 16 17 um, the percentage of students that made at least one level of growth uh, during that year but the, so we want to look at our star scores and how well do we perform on the star exams and these are our star spanish results and we've talked about our bilingual ESL programs in the past. We have what's considered an early exit model, meaning as quickly as possible we move students that can be successful in the English exam to the English exam. Um, that leaves us a small number of students that take the Spanish test, percentage-wise, compared to what many uh, school districts in the state do. Uh, you can see our results here, and um, in each of these categories we do <coughs> fall below the state, because the, the model statewide is not an early exit model. Um, so we have fewer testers that show up. I, we did the math, and if we did not have our early exit, if we had those students take the Spanish test and assume that they passed the Spanish test, uh, our numbers would actually be a little higher than the state on this slide. But the really important question here is how well do these students perform when they move to the English test? Because all students must pass an English test in secondary education. There is no Spanish test in junior high and high school. So how well do they perform when they move to the English test, and I'm proud to say they do outstanding. So this represents our students of their first year um, as a monitored ESL student. So the first year that they're no longer receiving uh, those daily direct services, okay. and they're taking the English test. And you can see wow. in every category, they outperform their monolingual peers. Um, so, and uh, that continues in year two as well. Um, they continue to outperform their monolingual peers. Um, so we are really proud of that. Um, you know, English 1 and 2, those are the hardest tests for all of our students. Um, and as you can imagine, if you're learning the language, those are going to be the last two that, that come around, but they still perform very well. Um, so we're, we're proud of them. All right, a lot, of, a lot of gear shifting here as we move forward. There's going to be a lot of new topics on, the, on each slide, and uh, this is always our favorite slide. You know, Dr. Stockton mentions this every year um, at the Celebrate Our Schools. If he only had one slide, this is the slide because this is why we do everything that we do. Um, our graduation rate continues to improve and be outstanding. We believe that 
Um, for last year, it was the highest ever in the history of our school district, and uh, our expectation is that we will be able to say that again next year if we can make it better. And that's our goal. And just a snapshot of the class of 2015, this, this information lags a little bit, so we don't have um, the newest information, but you can see uh, our students 95.7% graduating. Um, the gray students, those continued students, 2.1%, uh, we do very well with those students converting them to graduates. So they may not have made it in four years, but with the work of Rod Chavez and his department, our great counseling department, um, they go out and, and help these kids find a way. We, we tend to convert many of those students to graduates. Our graduation plans, as mentioned earlier, as part of that index four, we want our students to take the most challenging and rigorous curriculum that is appropriate for them. And so we want our students not, not to just take the easiest route. And so you see here, um, long-term data, you, what you really wanna see here is the, the blue and red becoming larger and the green becoming smaller. Green represents the minimum plan. Um, blue and red represent the more rigorous plan. And you can see we've continued to decrease the size of that green bar, which means our students are tracking more on the more difficult path. Now, this slide becomes op obsolete this year. Mm -hmm because our current seniors all go to the new graduation plan. So the next year, that the whole bar will be red. They'll all be on the foundations um, program. And uh, if you recall back when we had our House Bill 5 conversation, we've decided that as a district that all of our students will not only be on the foundations, but will um, we'll have an endorsement and will also be on the distinguished plan. That's our default measure um, for our students going forward is the distinguished plan. All right, SAT performance. Once again, we continue to perform well, uh, outpacing the state uh, and the nation. This slide uh, shows our longitudinal data with SAT, and the reason that it looks so different here is they changed the test. Okay, the SAT changed last year, so when they when they change the test, they rechange uh, or they renorm scoring. So the longitudinal data doesn't doesn't line up as well, but you can still see we've maintained our place as compared to the state and the nation even on the new test. And all the while, while improving our performance, we also continue the number of students taking the test, which is uh, a great thing. We want more and more students to take it, and we want to continue our fantastic performance. Each year, um, all, of, all juniors across the nation take the PSAT. Um, those students that perform in the top 1% nationwide on the PSAT uh, get the distinction of a National Merit Scholar. Um, you will get to meet these 24 outstanding students next month. They'll be here to be honored. You'll have a chance to meet them. One thing that we do in Connor ISD is we not only test our juniors, that's when it counts for this exam, but we test all of our sophomores so that they've had a chance to see the test. And additionally, many freshmen take the test as well. They're given an option as a freshman to take it, but we test all sophomores and then juniors. So mm -hmm. it gives our students a great opportunity to perform. The other major college entrance exam is the ACT. And you can see our um, results there on the ACT. Our composite trend uh, continues to be very positive. I mean, we've kind of bounced around here between some numbers, but that's a very high average for a district. It, you know, that year that we were 24-1 is extremely high, and 23.5 is still very high uh, as a district. And you know, the ACT is composed of um, multiple different subject tests. So you see our English, math, reading, and science performance. It's interesting to me that reading is now our strongest uh, subject. I think that's probably in no small part to our Read for a Better Life program that's been going on as long as these children have been in school, um, the emphasis on reading. Our college readiness trends, so on the ACT, if you uh, perform at a, the criterion level on all four exams, the, the ACT Corporation deems you college ready. And you can see our percentage of uh, testers at 45% being college ready compared to only 26% of the state testers. Advanced placement is a great opportunity for students to earn college credit while enrolled in high school. They are taught a college level course in their high school and at the conclusion of that course they take an exam. Uh, if they perform well enough on that exam they can receive college credit at almost any university across the nation. Um, 
last year we tested uh, 4,544 students and they took a total of 9,367 tests. That number continues to creep up, um, which is significant because I'm going to show you some other numbers here on the dual credit side that are skyrocketing. And so that combination gives our students a great opportunity to choose the path that's best for them um, to earn college credit in high school, which makes a difference as a parent, <laughs> I will tell you. It, I, I appreciate that opportunity that our students have. So as we talked about, they take a test at the conclusion of their AP um, course. This, the grading scale for an AP exam is one to five, five being the highest, and you can see that our average score, 2.89, um, is better than both the state and national. And this is always just interesting to see, just which classes are we taking the most exams in? World history continues to be our number one over and over again. We always point out um, the third one there, AP Human Geography. Uh, the exciting piece of that one is that's mainly freshmen. And so if they can get in an AP class as a freshman, receive college credit as a freshman in high school, uh, and gain some confidence and get on a track that helps them to take more and more of these advanced courses going through high school, it's, it's a positive. So we talked about our second route for students to earn college credit in high school, and that's uh, our great partnership with Lone Star College, dual credit. And dual credit is a college course taught in our high school. It's taught by one of our teachers, but that teacher is du duly employed by Lone Star College. So they teach the course, whatever grade they receive, that's a transcripted grade for us and for Lone Star College. Um, and you can see our numbers continue to rise on the dual credit side. And we're doing that without sacrificing the numbers in AP. So it means we're bringing more and more students into these advanced curriculum, uh, and, and that's great. Looking at our courses uh, through Lone Star, what, what classes do we do the most? English is um, our number one course, followed by history. In addition to, the, to these more traditional academic programs in our partnership with Lone Star College, we also have uh, workforce programs with Lone Star College. And a lot of these perform out of the Lone Star College Conroe campus. Um, it's right up here. Um, you can see welding, phlebotomy, uh, CNC, auto tech, and our newest one that we've had now just for a couple of years is our EMT um, uh, program. <clears throat> Students enrolled in CTE courses have opportunities to earn certifications. And this is really important for them because it gives them a leg up when they leave our programs and go out into the workforce. Um, oftentimes, these certifications may allow them to get hired over someone that doesn't have a certification, or it may uh, give them an opportunity to make more money. Uh, Serve Safe is one that we talk about often. That's the Serve Safe Food Handler certification. Uh, we've heard stories of students who go to be a, a waiter or waitress, and they make a quarter an hour more if they have serve safe certification. Um, additionally, the restaurant gets credit from the health department by, for the percentage of their employees that have serve safe certification. So it helps the student, it helps the, the restaurant. It's a great partnership. We're providing that not only to the students, but to uh, the business community as well. So we, we talk to our kids every year and ask them, well, what are your plans after high school? And we, we allow them to tell us more than one thing, so this won't add up to 100. They may tell us they're going to do this and that, but uh, we ask them what their plans are, and you can still see a, a majority of our students plan to go to a four-year college. Um, more and more of our students go to a two-year college, and we do have a lot of students that, that um, are going to go to work, and, and they may be putting themselves through college that way, and certainly those that have uh, dedicated themselves to go to our military as well. Well, where are they headed? Um, Texas A&M and, and UT, and I knew it, I knew it. Uh, Texas A&M and UT continue to be um, our two most frequent destinations for our students headed to four-year universities in Texas. And this just is a picture of Texas. We have students that fan out across the entire nation, and it just doesn't, we don't get that data back to allow us to create a slide, but we send students <coughs> everywhere. Um, it's really very impressive. And finally, just want to give uh, two quick commercials. Um, first for our college night, it occurred just a few weeks ago, and we had over 150 universities out at the Lone Star Convention Center. Um, we estimate about 5,000 people 
came through that night um, to, to talk to those universities. Um, it, it's really an impressive site. Uh, having been there as an administrator and a parent, it's amazing. Uh, and then upcoming and on October 26th is our career expo. So this is where we have industry um, out and students come out and learn about careers. And they may be learning about um, jobs that they can move into right after high school, but they're also learning about professional careers that they may come back to after uh, attending college. So that'll be at the Lone Star Convention Center. Everyone is welcome. Um, we would encourage you to come out uh, from 6 to 8. And that was a 100-page document that will be uploaded on our website uh, <laughs> next week in more slides than I probably wish it could have been, but I thank you for that, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you would have um, over any of our I, I do have one question. Okay. How many dual credit students do we have? Do you? I know we have roughly 2,000 dual credit classes being... The number of students enrolled? Uh -huh. I don't have that number. Okay. I'll you, get it to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get you. it to you and send it to you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Um, do you mind if we actually have this? I'd like to have the team that is here and that is present stand. I'd like to be great. thank them for their help. Yes, please do. Thank you very much. If, if I may, could we could we have the campus folks here? To, yes, as well? please, because, because that's where the real happen. work happens. Absolutely. So <laughs> all of our teachers, administrators, everybody that's on the campus, if you could stand up. So we can really thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Knoll. Item 5A, consider selection of design build firm for the life cycle replacement of stadium scoreboard systems project and authorize superintendent to negotiate and execute the design build contract. Dr. Stockton. Okay, I'll ask Easy Foster, our director of planning construction, to come to make that presentation. <clears throat> Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval the selection of a design-build firm for the life cycle replacement of our stadium school board systems. In August, you, our board of trustees, selected the design-build delivery method for this project, which is to replace, at the end of their life, service life, the school boards at both of our stadiums and inside the navatorium. Uh, PBK Architects prepared and published a request for qualifications for design build firms uh, to go along with this project. We had three companies respond. Uh, after reviewing those proposal or those qualification statements, we selected uh, two companies, Dactronics and Nevco, to participate in the interview portion of this procurement process. Following the interviews, Dactronics was selected as the offer offerer who submitted the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. Now this is based on our published uh, criteria and ranking evaluations which have made a part of this part of this item. At this point, we are asking for your approval of the selection. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on this? I, I am glad to see we're going to do this. I was at the game Friday and we had some scoreboard issues. So I'm uh, glad we're proceeding with this. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, receive capital improvements update. Mr. Foster. At this time, I'd like to have the opportunity to update you on our capital improvements that we have through, underway throughout the district. I'm going to start you with the Network Operations Center, which I'm happy to report this is the last update we'll be bringing you on this project. As we are completing the process of recapturing the office spaces where our data center used to be uh, and turning them over to useful, beneficial use for district uh, personnel uh, on into the future. So you're looking at uh, currently a view into two offices uh, upstairs where the data center used to be. And then we've also been able to reclaim some former tenant space in the front of this building for use by district staff in the future. Our safety and security project, which is an ongoing project, we are in phase two. And again, uh, following summer work, we're back above the ceiling where you can't really see what's going on. So it's just a representative of one of our security vestibules we did at San Jacinto Elementary. The project is on schedule and scheduled to run through the end of December. So we're currently working through the campuses, working out the bugs of the communications of the new systems versus the old systems, tying it all together so our campuses can use those systems for the new bur burglar systems, the new access control systems, new camera systems, and see those views. The project is, like I said, on schedule, scheduled to run through the end of the year, and we're working on now phase three, which we'll bring in the early spring for your approval to proceed on with that portion of this bond project. At Grand Oaks High School, where we are currently on schedule, uh, Grand Oaks is scheduled to open in August of 2018. 
Uh, you can see from these uh, overall pictures, the building itself is pretty well closed in at this point, and we're beginning to focus and see development of the athletic venues on the outside of the site now. Uh, all those venues are currently, like I said, they're on schedule. Everything is rolling like it should be, uh, so everything we anticipate moving along very well uh, in between rainstorms and other weather forecasts, which uh, we've been fortunate for so far. Now, inside that building, we're starting to see the finishes come together as we make our run towards uh, opening <laughs> that building in August. Uh, I look forward to showing you more pictures as the inside develops and the school takes on its personality from the inside. Moving over to Catherine Johnson Clark Intermediate School. Uh, that school is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2018, right alongside of Grand Oaks High School. You can see from here the building structure is moving along rapidly. We've begun the process of installing the uh, roof, roof decking systems, things of that nature. Uh, we've also begun masonry on this project. So this is the process where we're working rapidly to close that building in so we can see it catch up with the interiors you see at the high school. So it will be running parallel. Uh, right through the end of the end of the end of the summer as we take possession of that building Moving on to Conroe High School where we've got some additions and renovations We see here the foundations are installed for the central plant central plant Which is the new heartbeat of the air conditioning and mechanical systems that will ultimately serve Conroe High School now uh, and into the future uh, We're working on a building addition where we're adding classroom space to, to allow us to move students into so that we can uh, move forward with a big time upgrade of the mechanical systems of the main campus. So this project is on schedule, proceeding just as we would anticipate it to, and we're scheduled to be working on that campus until December of 2019. Clarification, yes, the, the, the new building will be obviously in the dirt area here? Yes, sir. The renovation, though, is behind the science wing, the gray top, if you will? Is, yes. is that correct? Those two wings that are connected up and downstairs? Yes, sir. I mean, the, the, the major, we're, we're overhauling the major portions of the main campus from the auditorium, which is not on this, this image, all the way back around, right up to the edge of the wall where the new building addition is going. So at some point, we will touch every part of those buildings above the ceiling, uh, upgrading those air conditioning systems. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Thank you. Madam President. May I, uh, if I'm within order to do so, ask that we move agenda item 9A up to this point? That was actually what I was just about to do as well. Um, item 9 is, 9A is is naming the headmaster for the Academy of Science and Health Professions. Dr. Stockton. It's my pleasure tonight to come and make a recommendation for the new headmaster. And um, these recommendations are always very, very important. And I'm very confident and proud of the person I'm going to recommend tonight, and that's Dr. Terry Benson. All right. Madam President, I, I'm, I move that we uh, approve. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. I was so, I was so, you, I was you so, moved that we approve. I was so in Dr. favor Benson. of it, I forgot what I was okay. going to say. How's that? So, so you moved that we approve Dr. Benson for headmaster uh, of the Yeah, academy. something like that. Okay. And I would second that. Thank second. You. All right. All those in Need favor? Dr. Benson, please come to the Thank you, Mr. Knapp. <laughs> President Bush, members of the school board, Dr. Stockton, thank you so much for the incredible opportunity of leading the Academy for Science and Health Professions and for placing faith in me to continue the academic excellence at Conroe High School in the capacity of headmaster. Dr. Papadimitriou has created a unique and special organization and I am truly honored and humbled to follow him and commit to furthering the positive culture and collegiate preparation of the students. I'm here today because of the great service you as our school board provides to our district and the leaders that you have selected to mentor all of us in CISD and I want to thank you. I want to thank so many people here for their support, guidance and mentorship. All of the uh, Conroe High School faculty and staff, Dr. Stockton, Dr. Curtis Knoll, Dr. Mark Weatherly, Dr. Michael Papadimitriou, Dr. Kathy Sharples, all of our CISD leadership team, I am here as a product of all of your hard work, and I thank you. I also
also want to acknowledge the support and friendship of Ron and Kay Galindo and Becky Page, David Knapp, and Jean Ann Gloria, who are here tonight. But I would be remiss not to acknowledge my wonderful family, who is all here. My wonderful husband, Matt Benson. Stand up, Matt. <laughs> My children, Sage and John, who are also products of CISD. My mother, Linda Cavill, an educator in CISD and the person who led me to a career in education. And my in-laws, Chris and Larry Benson. Without them, I would not be here tonight, and I thank you for all of the love and support you have offered me. I am immensely grateful for this opportunity and strive to continue and advance the reputation for academic excellence that CISD has established in the Academy for Science and Health Professions. And I thank you for this honor. Thank you. Madam President, may I take a moment of personal privilege? Yes. Dr. Benson, I know I speak on behalf of all the board, and I say thank you for the service you've already performed for us. And as a parent, thank you for everything you have done for my family. And we are truly looking forward to more great things from you. So thank you for all that you've done. and know that we're right there beside you the whole way. Thank you very much. Yes. All of uh, Dr. Benson's family, uh, we normally move this a little further up, but tonight we kind of kept it a little bit further in the agenda. And so thank you all for bearing with us until 7.15. Please feel free to go and celebrate. Um, Dr. Benson, I, I really am thrilled to see this happen. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you all. All right. Sage, let's get that homework done. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is 6A, discuss the possible reappraisal of property damage due to Hurricane Harvey. Dr. Stockton. Okay, this time I'll ask Darren Rice, our CFO, to come present the item and the next several items of fact. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. Uh, this evening I'd like to begin the discussion with just some updated information that I've received from the appraisal district and from TEA. Um, I was able to talk with the appraisal district on Monday and got an update on the number of homes that they have determined to be damaged due to Hurricane Harvey. As you remember at the board workshop, we were using a number of 6,000 homes. Uh, on Monday that number was updated to 2,278 properties that were damaged. Uh, do not expect that number to go too far above 2,300 homes. So they feel they, they've got far enough along to where they know where they're at on that. <coughs> um, talking with TEA, uh, TEA is going to count uh, the loss as an exemption, but it will be a state exemption, not a local exemption. So basically they're holding us harmless on that. So any revenue loss we feel in 17-18, we get back in 1819. Um, so total tax revenue decrease in the general fund, 1065000 dollars In the debt service fund, 245000 dollars And our cost will be right around $83,000 for uh, the appraisal district fees. So our loss, our total loss over the two years will be less than $350,000. Uh, Ron? Let me just, I, I was not at the workshop, okay? Mm -hmm. I apologize. Uh, oh, no I, my mother was ill, but uh, I just want to clarify some things, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. So we've gone from 6,000 to, and this is because of the, you know, infamous delay, right? That, you know, whatever. But we've gone from 6,000 to 2,278. Yes, sir. 75, whatever. Less than 2,300, if you will. From 3.5 million to 350,000 all in. Well, all, well. I mean, originally, we were talking because we did not know what the state was potentially going to do. three and a half million with as much as several hundred thousand dollars of cost to have the program written, and then, of course, sometime in this past week, we found out that we we're going to be held harmless, and Correct. all this by Tammy and other people involved said that really there's nothing to do until November. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That there would be no 
no effect one way or the other Correct. other we than until the knowledge of it being done yes okay so obviously we have garnered more facts yes okay thank you that's all i wanted to make sure that i understand it correctly okay the total tax savings to our residents i, I you broke it down with debt service and operations mm -hmm. and i'm sorry I, I missed the total of that i understand our total cost because the state doesn't hold us harmless for the debt service number only for the mno correct mm -hmm. Yes. So the total tax savings to our residents is what? The total tax savings will be about one point three million dollars. Okay. It averages on a on a average property value of two hundred sixty nine thousand dollars, about five hundred and forty dollars okay. per household. Are there any other questions or any other discussion points? Thank you, Mr. Rice. Consider uh, item 6B, consider adopting the resolution for authorizing the reappraisal of property damage due to Hurricane Harvey. Uh, this resolution was in all of our board pa packets for all of us to review. Uh, any comments on it before we actually have a motion? I just want to make sure we've all read it and are clear. All right. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. I second the motion. All right. Any discussion on approving? All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you all very much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Rice and Dr. Stockton, for continuing the discussions with TEA and uh, Tammy McRae and Tony Belanowski. I appreciate the work that has been put in on this. Item 6C, receive information regarding request for proposal for naming rights to the currently named Wood Forest Bank Stadium and the Natatorium. Mr. Rice. Tonight, we're providing the board with information related to an upcoming request for proposals for naming rights to the South County Stadium, currently named Wood Forest Bank Stadium, and the district's natatorium. In February 2007, the Board of Trustees approved a stadium naming right, rights agreement with Wood Forest National Bank. This agreement expires October 31, 2018. The district is preparing a request for proposal that will be released to the public through the district's online e-bidding system, seeking pro proposals from businesses interested in purchasing the rights to name the stadium and or the natatorium. Those inter interested will submit their proposals in December. Proposals will be evaluated on the monetary value of the offer, the contract length and terms, advertising content, and any other relevant factor which the district identifies as necessary to determine best value. Once proposals are received, they will be reviewed by a district committee to evaluate and rank the best value offers. The district anticipates that any contracts awarded pursuant to this RFP to be in effect for a negotiated period uh, of a minimum of 10 years from the date of award, with the possibility of extending the contract for additional increments. And this is not a voting item. This no, is just, just receiving information. information. And this is the first time we're actually looking at potentially splitting out the natatorium and, from the stadium and having potentially two separate names depending yes, upon yes. proposals uh, that can Nine be. years ago, we, we entered an agreement for Wood Forest Bank Stadium, and mm -hmm. we want to include the natatorium in this naming, okay. right? And, and, and it's and or. They can. Right. They could do both. both or they or could do one or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? All right, <coughs> item 6D, consider award of RFP 17-01-01A, Contracted Educational Services, Professional Development, and Educational Consulting Services. Yes, tonight we're recommending the Board of Trustees consider awarding RFP 17-01-01A, Contracted Educational Services, Professional <coughs> Development, and Educational Consulting Services, October 2017, to the 20 vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated annual expenditure of approximately $40,000. Thus far, 136 vendors of an estimated 350 have been awarded since June of 2017. After evaluation by the appropriate department, recommended vendors will be presented to the Board of Trustees for consideration on a monthly basis. This amount of $40,000 is included in the previously awarded annual estimate of $1.5 million. Service contracts with awarded vendors will remain firm through October 31, 2018, with an option to renew annually for four additional one-year terms through October 31, 2022. And at this time, I recommend your approval. Do I have a motion? So moved. 
Second. <laughs> Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Now the financial reports, item 6E. Yes, I'm here this evening to present the financial statements for the district for the month of September. And these statements will include the general fund, debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet for the district. The balance sheet includes our assets, <coughs> our liabilities, and our fund balances. Each month we like to look at our cash and investments. And we'll concentrate once again on the general fund. As you can see, we have cash on hand of $13,300. We have bank deposits of $151,000. We have investments in the state pools of $93.6 million. We have short-term investments, which are, which are less than a year, of $29.7 million. And our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors of $51.6 million for total cash and investments in the general fund of $175 million. The next statement we'll look at is our income statement for the month. The income statement includes our revenues and expenditures and fund balances. And we'll just look here at our expenditures for the month. We don't have many revenues coming in yet. Um, this is our year-to-date expenditures by major category. Uh, looking at the general fund, you can see the largest expenditure there is payroll, uh, debt service, it is debt service, child nutrition, is supplies and materials, and in self-funded insurance is contracted services. This is our 2015 bond referendum status for the month of September. Uh, we've currently expended and encumbered $302.2 million. We have a project forecast of the projects of $514.8 million, uh, leaving us with an estimate to complete of an additional $212.6 million. That'll leave us with a contingency of $5.4 million. Uh, good news to report once again on our self-funded insurance. Uh, for the month, month of September, we had total revenues of $3,964,000. Uh, we had total expenses, $2,858,000. For our revenues over expenses of $1.1 million. I would like to point out that I, I think the hurricane in there being, you know, that week might have, might have had, had a little to play. But, but looking at the trend so far this month, we're still looking good also for this month, too. So, so trending very well. Uh, participation at our wellness centers. Uh, good activity there, 470 patients visited our, our wellness center, so, so our clinics are, are working well. How's the Conroe Center doing? Um, it was slow, but it's getting better. It's picking up as, as more people are realizing it's there. Okay. Our investments for the month. Par value at the end of September was $324 million. In the pools, our weighted average maturity was one day, we're yielding 1.23%. Our shorter term investments, once again, less than a year, 99 days, 1.33%. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors, the uh, WAM is 514 days, and it's yielding 1.25%. And our combined portfolio, WAM is 84 days, and we're yielding 1.25%. And our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is right at 1.05%. Right. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, we are now going to go into executive session, and so this will be a closed session of the board held on matters contained in the notice up for this meeting authorized by Section 551-071, 551-0.074, and 551.0821 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any Final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed session uh, or executive meeting, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be either at this public meeting upon reconvening of the meeting or at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. Closed session of the board will now be held, and it is 7.28 p.m. All in favor, adjourned. We're done. What time is it? It is 8.45. Five.